Anne Burrell is attached to the European Commission's Environment Directorate General, where she is Deputy Head of Unit for International Relations and Enlargement. Her work particularly concerns environmental relations with EU neighbors that aim to eventually become EU member states or that have taken on commitments to progressively converge their national policies with EU standards and norms in the context of the European Union neighborhood policy. Her previ res previous responsibilities in the, com in the Commission include development of the European Union's policy on integrated coastal zone management, serving as the EU's focal point to the Barcelona Convention, policy research on water management and agro-meteorological modeling. Prior to joining the European Commission, she worked as a spatial analyst and environmental information consultant in Africa. During her stay at the University of Washington, she will be undertaking research on the factors that motivate industry in the United States and the Pacific Northwest to improve their environmental performance and resource efficiency. Now, uh, Ms. Burrell's visit to, to BYU is part of a, of a larger um, purpose, not only is uh, she delivering this lecture today in Cafe CSE this afternoon at 4 o'clock, she'll also be meeting with key faculty and our Model European Union team, which will compete this winter semester up at the University of Washington and is preparing to discuss many of these same issues. Um, her topic today, the European Union at a Crossroads. Please join me in welcoming Anne Burrell. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for coming to listen to me. Um, this morning I want to talk a little bit about sort of current events, where we are in Europe. Um, we've seen some not so nice headlines over the past few months. Angela Merkel declared in November that it was the toughest hour since World War II. And just on Monday we saw Standard & Poor's downgrading nine out of the 17 Eurozone member states. So it, it makes it look like we're certainly in some tough times. Um, what I'd like to do is take a step back and look a little bit at why the EU was founded. What are the trends that have driven it in the past? Um, a little bit the scope of what the EU is trying to do today and what I think some of the key issues and trends are at the moment. So starting very basically, what is the European Union? I think probably most of you in the room know this, but it's always good to, to start with the basics. Um, it's not a country. It's not a federal state. It is an economic and political partnership between 27 democratic countries. Uh, the countries have voluntarily come together and decided to share sovereignty and decision making. That means that the countries think that they are better off deciding in common and having common rules. Um, I think that it's very important to understand that this is a voluntary union, but also that they are countries that are very different in and of themselves. But w in this dynamic, the EU is constantly changing. We've been evolving over the past 50 years. We continue to evolve with an extension of the policies and also of the geographic scope of the EU. Just to emphasize a little bit this question of diversity, um, Look at the different sizes of the countries in the EU. You've got Germany, which has 81 million people. You've got Malta, that's got less than half a million. Okay? Um, you've got rich countries. You've got poor countries. You've got countries who are export-driven. You've got countries who are kind of struggling to produce enough for their own internal markets. You've got countries who are much more liberal. You've got countries that are more traditional. So. Big diversity, but all these countries have come together and decided that they're better off working together rather than pursuing their global future on their own independently. Um, perhaps we also can go back and say, well, why did they come to this conclusion? Well, it stemmed out of the Second World War. Europe during the Second World War was a pretty nasty place. Um, there were a lot of people dead. There were a lot of people hungry. There were a lot of people without proper places to live. And they hadn't only been through it once, they'd been through it twice. It was the First World War and then the Second World War. And the political thinkers, probably followed by most of the citizens, thought it probably wasn't a good idea to tempt fate and go for a third time round. So they said, OK, what's the best thing we can do to try to prevent having Europe descend into a Third World War? Well, they realized that if you are dependent on your neighbor, 
If their well-being is integrally linked to your own well-being, you're probably not going to go and bomb them. So that was the start of the EU. It was the idea of promoting economic integration, but not just for the purpose of economic integration, but for a very important and strong political purpose, and that was to ensure peace and prosperity in the EU and in, in Europe and prevent another war devastating the, the continent. So the EU really started in 1952 with the European Steel and Coal Community. Those products were chosen because those are the products that are at the root of a war effort. That, well, if you link together your coal and your steel markets, it would be a little harder for one country to build up a war machine and attack another. And this, this was the basic core thinking at the very beginning of the EU. But of course, we got beyond the war years, and people started thinking a little more broadly, thinking, well, yeah, that doesn't work so badly. And in fact, we probably would do better off, we would have bigger markets if we linked together our economies more broadly. So we saw move towards a customs union, a free trade area in the, the late 60s, at which time the common agricultural policy was also established. Agriculture is fundamental to the well-being of the society. Everybody needs to eat. And it was clear that even in 1968, Europe had not yet recovered from the war in terms of agricultural production. Um, so the agricultural policy was established, again, an economic tool, but to meet the broader goals of providing well-being for the people of Europe. We moved on to the Single Europe Act when we extended the market in agricultural goods to economic commodities in general. And finally, we established the <coughs> European Monetary Union in 1999. So this looks like a litany of economic moves. But what I'd like to stress is that it was always done with a bigger purpose, and the bigger purpose being to promote peace, prosperity, and knowing that one country could not go it alone in the broader global context. And we've been pretty successful in a lot of this. We've now got the largest global single market. Um, it's 20% of the global GDP, which compares, uh, the statistics tell me, 19% in the US and 14% in China. So it's a big market um, for the producers and consumers. And there are, at least in principle, no barriers to the movement of goods, services, people, or capital. I say in principle because there are still some things that don't work as smoothly as they should, particularly in um, the movement of services. There's some of the, for instance, insurance companies, it's a bit hard to, to work across borders. But these freedoms of movement exist. They function. And in fact, they function so well that most people in Europe have kind of forgotten that it, they weren't always, it wasn't always that way. They now take these freedoms for granted. Um, and of course, I said it's now much more than just an economic union. Um, the EU has policy legislation in a vast range of areas. Um, so for instance, fisheries policy, the fisheries ministers from all of the EU member states come together each year in December and they decide the quotas for fishing for the EU as a whole. Again, they've decided to come together and pool their competence because they think they can manage fishing stock better if they have a common agreement rather than each one kind of battling one against the other. Um, same for energy. There's a move now to create a much more unified policy on energy for the EU. EU is a net energy importer, um, and we know that <coughs> it's an important commodity for developing our economy and our, we need it for our lifestyle, so we'll be better off if we can really have a true common policy on energy. And of course environment, which is the area I work in, um, there are over 300 major pieces of legislation in the field of environment. So much, much more than just economy. Um, one policy I just want to particularly stress because I think it's, it's at the root of a lot of thinking in the EU, the philosophy in the EU, and it perhaps it's a little bit different from in the US, is the principle of cohesion policy. The EU, from the very beginning, 
The original treaty said that the community, because then it was called the European Community, not the European Union, shall aim at reducing the disparities between the levels of development of the various regions inside the EU. So this is an explicit goal, an explicit aim of the EU. It's a redistribution policy between the regions of the EU. And it works not just through sort of cash transfers, but through investing in creating infrastructure, knowledge, training in the areas that are not as competitive. Another very important policy, and it's very much related in the EU, is the policy of enlargement. EU started with six countries. Um, it today is 27. The first enlargement in 1973 brought in the UK and Denmark and Ireland. Uh, they were countries that weren't so different from the original six. So they fit in relatively well economically and politically. But since then, several of our enlargements have brought in countries that were very different, countries in the south of Europe who were dictators until the um, 1970s or 1980s. Um, the countries of Eastern Europe, who spent a period under communist regimes and came into the EU a lot poorer than the original core countries. So we have a policy of trying to expand the single market. We see it as a way of promoting both broader market for EU citizens, but also protecting our peace and prosperity through ensuring that this broader peace and prosperity across Europe. But in doing this, we're bringing in more diversity each time. And we have the ambition to try to bring all of the countries up more or less to the same standard, to make sure that the poorer countries have possibilities to advance. So in fact, this dynamic of enlargement is very integrately related to the cohesion policy. And the cohesion policy was reinforced in the 1980s when Greece, Spain, and Portugal joined. Because they were behind, because they were poor, because they needed investments and assistance to improve their competitivity. And we see the same thing again after the enlargement of 2004 and 2007, that the cohesion policy, which is now the largest single budget item in the EU budget, and I'm, I stress it's the budget of the EU itself, not of the individual countries. Um, you can see that it goes largely to the countries that joined in 2004-2007, with some of the other peripheral areas still receiving um, some finance. One thing that I just wanted to emphasize here is the way that relative regional poverty is defined, or the way regional poverty is defined. It's relative. You can see that the areas that benefit from the cohesion policy funds, and there are various different funds, are defined on the basis of relative GDP. So poverty in Europe is compared to the average. So it's the areas where the GDP per capita is under 75% or, in some cases, 81.5% of the EU average. So again, this, this theory that everybody will be better off if the poorer regions are brought up closer to the average. Okay. Um, important to remember, enlargement is still continuing. We, we had, it was a very, very important policy um, during the late 90s and the 2000s when the, the countries of Eastern and Central Europe came in. But still, we believe that there are other countries who should one day join the EU, and particularly the countries of the Balkans. Um, Turkey is also a candidate country, and Iceland. You see the ones in blue are actually designated candidate countries, while, while the other ones in the Balkans don't yet officially have that status, but it's been there's been a policy statement that one day, when they meet the conditions and the requirements, they should also join the EU. Croatia is slated to join next year if the ratification process goes ahead in all of the member states. So with this problem of diversity, with this dynamic of enlarging the EU, of course, the question of how much immigration do we want, what are the drawbacks of immigration also comes back. And that's, that's key in a lot of the political debate in Europe today. Um, there's a fear of job competition. There's a fear of too much diversity. And we particularly see that when we have immigrants coming from countries which have different religions and have different backgrounds to 
the original core of Europe. Um, in a lot of people's minds, these people are coming in and taking away jobs. Um, that is also one of the drivers of fears of immigration. There's also a connection made between immigrants, even legal immigrants, and some of the problems of smuggling and illegal trafficking of, about, of both people and goods. So these issues are driving a public debate, public concern about immigration's issues. In fact, if we, look, if we go back and look at the figures, immigration is not a huge problem. And it's, in fact, it's something that actually Europe as a whole does need as the European population ages. Um, we need more young people who are in the working age. And in fact, that's the, I will, I will make these slides available later. You don't have to read all of the words and copy it down. But we find the people who are coming in generally are fairly young. Um, they are people who will contribute to the economy and the growth of Europe. Um, and perhaps the biggest proof is that after the enlargement in 2004 and 2007, everybody was really worried these countries are going to come in. All the Polish plumbers are going to come and overrun our countries. In fact, there haven't been any major problems. Um, and it, it has not proved, it's, we find the proportion of the migrants in the EU is still actually quite small. Um, we have there, I'm trying to find my figures now, um, it's only now 6.5% of the EU population, which I'm not quite sure what the figure is now in the US, but in the US I know it's higher than that. Um, but this is a fear in the minds of a lot of the citizens. So there, this is an area where the EU has been developing policy. It's, um, we're trying to organize the legal immigration that we need better to try to improve the integration of the legal immigrants and to curb the irregular and illegal immigration. Countries are working together in what's called the Schengen area, which I'm sure you've heard about, the area where people can move freely without passports. If you can move freely without passports, if you're there legally, you can also do it if you're there illegally, which means that if you have an external border, you better make sure that people don't get in illegally because it's not going to be just your problem, but a problem of all the other countries. So the countries in the Schengen area work together on immigration issues, also on cooperation on justice and home affairs. Um, but in talking about all this, I want to stress that actually all the while we're trying to curb illegal immigration, we are actually going out and trying to recruit labor to come into the EU. Um, well, we have to talk about the euro, of course. That's, that's what everybody is thinking about, worrying about. Let's go back and look a little bit. Why is the euro there? Well, the euro, the idea of the euro actually started well back in the early 70s. There was a realization that if you want to have a single market, one of the barriers to trade is having different currencies. You have a problem if you want to buy, so if you're in France, you want to buy something from Germany and you don't know what value the Deutsche Mark is going to have next week, it may be a little bit difficult to commit to importing something. Um, certainly you can do it, but you take a risk. And even if the risk pans out in your favor, you're still going to be paying transaction costs. So the euro was conceived, or at least originally the alignment of currencies in a currency band was conceived as a tool for facilitating the single market. And the thinking behind it evolved in the 80s. We first, in 1999, had the exchange rates frozen. And then the euro was actually introduced physically in 2002. Okay. Um, as I started already saying, why? Well, it removes exchange rate risks. It facilitates. The, f the single market in general, both for consumers and for producers. It makes prices more stable across the EU. If somebody can compare the prices in um, Portugal and Finland, they're going to eventually balance out more than if they are, are wildly different. It's also important for the EU as a global economic player. If there is one currency for the EU or most of the EU, it's easier for the EU to have a significant trade presence and facilitate exchanges with other parts of the world. But, of course, there's always um, a shadow on any uh, 
positive thing, and that is that as soon as you introduce a single currency, the individual countries can no longer have control over their exchange rates, and they can no longer decide to print themselves out of economic problems. So in the past, if you had countries like Greece or Italy and they ran in, into economic problems, what did they do? Well, either they devalued their currency and or they printed lots of money. And that got them over the, the short-term economic problem. Um, they can't do that anymore. So this is one of the constraints of having a single currency. Um, now, we knew from the beginning when the euro was introduced that if you want to have a single currency, it's not going to function too well if the fiscal policies of all of the individual countries are very different. So right from the beginning, there was a concern about making sure that the countries had some discipline in terms of public deficit and debt. So back from 1997 already, there was the Stability and Growth Pact, which said that member states had to avoid excesses. This was done to make the euro work right. The problem was it wasn't really done. Um, <laughs> it was there on paper. It was there in principle. But there was a kind of reluctance to meddle in the affairs of another country. There was the feeling that, well, you know, who was France to tell Italy how to organize their national budget? So in practice, there actually was not as much fiscal discipline as there should have been. And we see, particularly in Greece and Italy, but not only in Greece and Italy, that there was a huge public deficit in the debt. At the same time, we saw that there were trade imbalances. And this is where Germany did great out of the euro. They exported lots of things to all the other countries of Europe. And so you might say, Germany is a stellar performer. Everything went fine. Well, yes, except in fact, Germany should have been importing from the other countries. For the model to work smoothly, when you export, you get extra currency. Then you should be importing from your trading partners. So the imbalance, either on the excessive deficit or the excessive surplus, is one of the drivers behind the problems we see today. Um, in some countries, particularly, um, for instance, in Ireland, there were problems of private sector debt, problems in the banking sector not entirely unrelated to the banking problems that happened a couple of years ago or started a couple of years ago in the US. Those are all purely economic fiscal factors. But the problems behind the euro crisis that we have today actually go further than that. And I think when we're talking about solutions, we're talking about where we can go for the future. It's important to realize that it's not just about debt and deficit. It's not just about um, overspending or importing or exporting enough. Some of the countries have very serious underlying problems of competitivity. Now, we've got this policy of cohesion where we're supposed to be helping all the countries come up, but it hasn't yet worked sufficiently for some of the countries. And in particular, Portugal, who is trying really, really hard now to get all their finances in order. Also, Greece, who's maybe trying a little less hard. That's my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> Their underlying problem is not the fiscal problem per se. The problem is that their economies are not competitive, and they're never going to move ahead unless they become more competitive or producing more. Um, certainly, in some of the countries, again, Ireland and in Spain, there were real estate bubbles. I don't have to tell you in the US what happens when you have a real estate bubble. Those were also problems leading to the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. And of course, we have to realize that we're not the only ones facing these kind of problems. This is a global problem about the banking situation and global competition is increasing from other parts of the world. That's being felt in the US also. Um, but you hear everyone saying the euro can't fall apart. Okay, Why can't it fall apart? Well, I've already talked about all the benefits of having the euro, but digging just a little bit deeper, you've got a country like Greece. If Greece leaves, Yes, OK, they could default, their currency would be devaluated, and then all of a sudden their products, um, including their to go stay in their hotels, would seem cheap. That would boost their, their exports. But it would take them still a long time to recover their budgetary balance, and they wouldn't have the support that they're getting now from the other countries at the EU. Even more than that, if a country drops out of the euro, what do you think the investors are going to think about their, that country? 
you're doing so badly that you can't even stay in the euro. This is very much a crisis of confidence. So dropping out of the euro is not all of a sudden going to make the investors think, you're doing everything right. We're going to go invest in Greece. Even more than that is the political cost. And it's a political cost both to a country that would potentially leave and also to the richer countries. Richer countries would have problems because of the investment that they have in any poorer country. There are banking links. We know that. Um, but the EU as a whole, its credibility would decline. The project of building the single market would decline. We, our whole policy of cohesion would be put in danger. It would be taking steps backward, not just in the economic realm, but in this whole political dynamic of trying to be, build peace and prosperity on the continent. Um, and I mean, that's, that's not something people have just woken up and thought of today. I mean, we've been trying since early 2011 to address the crisis, which I, I really see as a political crisis. It was, it was triggered by these economic problems with the euro, with the debt, but it's really a political crisis that Europe is facing now. Why, why is it taking so long to address it? Why aren't we moving ahead? Well, there are several factors, and certainly one of the factors is this problem of the lack of common economic and fiscal policy, and what I alluded to before, the, the resistance historically to interfere in the fiscal policies of different countries. Another big factor, and this is something that is, is really important in Europe and perhaps is not understood as much in the US, is the fear of inflation. And this goes back again to the Second World War. In the lead up to the war, Germany went through a hyperinflation. And at least in the minds of German citizens, that was one of the contributing factors to the Second World War. So they, the, the Germans in particular, but Europeans as a whole, are very, very concerned about inflation. Inflation is seen as the worst possible thing that could happen. Now, I already said individual countries can't just devalue their way, way out of a crisis. But yeah, the euro as a whole, the, we could start printing more euros and devalue the currency. But the reason that's not done is because Europe, particularly the Germans, do not want to see inflation. And so the primary aim, actually, of the European Central Bank is to keep inflation under control. So that's certainly something that constrains the response in Europe. But probably what I see as the biggest roadblock, the biggest constraint on taking action at the moment is the fact that we are 27 countries that are very different. Um, and in matters of such great importance as this, you need to have unanimity between the countries. And I would add, even in the areas where there's kind of a voting system, the Tradition is you still try to get unanimity between the countries. So if you have a fiscal problem in the US, you've got enough problems with the, the Congress trying to come up with solutions. Can you imagine also if you had to have the governors of all the states in the US come together and agree on changes you were going to be making? And the US states are less diverse than the countries of Europe. So this, this is what we're facing. But I think everyone realizes now that there is a problem, that it does need to be solved. It's not a technical issue. It's not a purely economic issue. Um, but the heads of state came together already back in July and said they'll do, and I've underlined that, whatever is needed to ensure the financial stability of the euro area. Not because the euro itself is something that they, they feel they need to have the, the coins in their hand, but because this is part and parcel of the bigger economic policy and political objectives in Europe. The other thing that we've seen changing, and I think this is very interesting, um, is that although the expectations of the citizens have gone down over the last 20 years, and even though the trust in government institutions has declined in general, you still see that the EU is trusted more than the national governments, which when I saw the statistic, I thought it was kind of interesting, particularly when you see some of the British press, which says all sorts of nasty things about the EU. In the euro area, the support for the euro is still 64%, with only 29% against. That means the other ones aren't sure. Um, and this is from this autumn. And again, people think that the European Union is the entity which is in the best position to solve these problems rather than national governments or the IMF or, or anyone else. 
including the, the U.S. I'm not quite sure what, what the U.S. was supposed to be doing to solve the EU <laughs> problems, but okay, that's the way the question was asked. Um, in addition, we find now that the citizens of Europe are coming to a consensus that it's okay to meddle in other countries' fiscal affairs. And this is something that I, I doubt it was asked a year ago, but I'm pretty sure if you'd asked a year ago, it would not only been the politicians, but also the citizens would have said, no, you can't come in and mess up, mess, mess around in the development of a national budget in another country. But now people say that's okay. Um, and that's a huge shift in public opinion. And I think this kind of underlines how important the citizens and the politicians feel it is to sort out the mess. And this, this actually gives me a lot of hope for optimism. Um, we have outlined now a roadmap to move ahead. You can see that part of it is really addressing the short-term issues about um, the, the crisis in Greece, the banking system. But the more far-reaching issues are how to build growth, how to build stability, particularly in the poorer parts of Europe, um, how to build more robust and integrated economic governance across Europe. The risk that we're facing at the moment is not all of the countries agree, and it's particularly my country, the UK, um, that is holding out. Now, there are lots of reasons that the UK is slightly different from the rest of Europe, including that London is a big banking center, including that the UK has a stronger bilateral tie with the US than the other countries do, so it feels it can ride out the storm. There are cultural and historical reasons, too. But the risk is that we may, and we, this, this is a very real risk, see that the countries in the Euro, perhaps with some of the other countries that have not yet joined the Euro but will one day, will move ahead in this fiscal compact to strengthen economic governance, to strengthen this interference in one another's budgets. And we may see the UK not joining it. Um, and I, I see that as a risk for the UK more than anything else, but this would also be problematic for the EU as a whole because the UK is part of the single market. It is entirely integrated into the, the economic union of the EU. And so this, this is a big political risk at the moment. But the other countries of Europe have said, well, you know, we really, really want the UK on board. But if the UK is not going to come on board, we're going to move ahead. And the present plan, that there are drafts of this fiscal compact circulating at the moment. The plan is that it should be agreed at a summit on the 30th of this month for signature in March. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. And in fact, my feeling is we've got a real mess and we've got problems and they have to be sorted out. But perhaps we were too complacent before. Perhaps we were taking the single market for granted. We were taking for granted the fact that we can travel across Europe and we can buy and sell and you know, life was good. Well. Maybe we weren't paying attention to some of the problems we should have been paying to. And maybe now this crisis will be the impetus for fixing some of these real problems, um, for really working on this issue of economic governance, but also on this problem of cohesion. It's there. It's in the principles of the EU. But we need to invest in some of the poorer parts of Europe. We need to make sure that they are developing their education system, their infrastructure, their training, so that they can help themselves, so that they can move ahead their economies. And I, I want to be optimistic. Um, I guess I have to be optimistic. Uh, you know, I, I, I live in Europe. I have uh, my salary in the euro, so, so I want things to work out. But I, I really do think that it's too important to fail. You talk about banks and companies too big to fail. The political importance of the, Europe, of the euro in Europe is too great. It underlies not only the single market, but really the whole European project. Where do I see we are now? Well, just in the past couple of days, Spain and Italy succeeded in bond auctions, and the European Central Bank chief said he's optimistic. That's a good sign. Um, the fact that many countries lost their AAA ratings is a bad sign, but we see we're not the only country in the world in that situation. Um, there's a discussion on Tobin tax. President Sarkozy's the tax on financial tra transactions. Um, that seems to be gaining speed, although Germany is not in favor of it. I put a question mark. It's, it's a trend. I'm not sure whether it's, it's good or bad how we're going there. 
Um, the Italians seem to be getting their act together. Um, Italians underneath have a pretty healthy economy. They've got, they've got quite a lot of innovation. They've got a lot of SMEs, particularly in the north, that are producing things that are still selling. Their problems are probably more fiscal and governmental than anything else, but they seem to be moving in the right direction. They were even praised by Angela Merkel, so that's, that's a pretty good thing. Um, Greece has still got some problems. That's, that's a downside. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen in Greece, but that's a negative point. Um, but for me, perhaps one of the most positive things is that there seems to be more attention being paid to this need to invest in the poorer regions, this focus on cohesion policy. Um, just sort of coming back to the question of enlargement, I said that's one of the big trends in Europe. Have we scared away all the applicant countries? Not at all. Um, Croatia's still online. They want to join next year. The other countries are knocking on the door, so they at least don't think things are too bad in the EU. And even Turkey, who is that their application is much more complicated. There are many more issues at stake. They're a huge country. They're joining the EU. will change both the EU and Turkey in fundamental ways. But, you know, they're still interested in the EU, and they're saying, and I think rightly, that uh, their coming into the EU family would actually help strengthen the, the EU. But certainly, they're still interested in us. So what's my prognosis? OK, no, no crystal ball. Um, I'm not, not uh, promising anything. but. In my opinion, the EU has gone through many, many changes. It's gone through ups and downs. Um, this is a down. But the political project, the underlying need for integration between the countries, the realization that interdependence makes the continent stronger, I don't think that's changed. And I think, I hope, that this crisis will be the stimulus to move ahead to promote better economic stability, to raise up the competitiveness of some of the poorer regions, to sort out our economic governance, and to keep going with our project on peace and prosperity. So thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Hill. I'm a, a double major in political science and economics. Uh, my question is kind of about a final equilibrium for the European project. Um, I, there's kind of, uh, at least in history, we haven't seen uh, such a loose organiza organization of states last for very long, uh, either kind of crumbles or becomes like the United States, more integrated federation. Uh, what do you see kind of as the final goal uh, or your opinion of where we'll end up either in disintegration or uh, a closer union? Okay, well, um, I, th I think you can probably infer from what I said that I, I think I, we are going to see closer integration. How far it's going to go, I really can't tell you. But, but we have seen, through all the ups and downs, the benefits of being more integrated. I mean, e even a country like Germany, if it were standing alone on the global scale, would be nothing. Um, so I think we're going to see that trend continuing as far as depth of integration. But there's a principle in Europe called subsidiarity. And that says if things can be done better, it's kind of like states' rights. If things can be done better at the local or regional level, they should be done at that level. And certainly, there's some things um, that are going to continue to be done at the local level, partly because the countries are so different. Um, but I, I think we will probably see Continuing economic integration, I think we will continue to see strengthening of policies, including, a, a, say, the energy policy is a new objective that we're seeing move ahead. I think perhaps the more interesting question, in a way, is where the geographic limits are going to be. Um, certainly, the countries, there's a political commitment to bring in the countries of the Balkans. 
Um, Iceland is not very controversial. If the Icelanders continue to think, and they're now not so sure, they want to join the EU, that will happen quite smoothly. I could talk for half an hour about Turkey, and I'm not going to, but Turkey is a big country that will have a profound impact on the EU. It's, it would contribute incredibly to the economy of the EU, but the public opinion is not yet entirely in favor, and some of the bigger countries fear that if Turkey comes in, they'll lose some of their dominant position. So what will ultimately happen with Turkey, I don't know. I th my personal opinion is that it would be good for Turkey to join the EU, both for economic reasons and also as a bridge to other parts of the world to show that a country like Turkey, which is Islamic, can contribute to something like the EU in a peaceful, uh, prosperous way. But I think public appetite at the moment probably stops that point. Um, some of the countries further east, like Ukraine and Moldova, have voiced their EU aspirations. Certain EU countries, and I think particularly of Poland, would like to see the EU extend out further to the east, but at least for the foreseeable future, we don't see that as very pragmatic. And this is why, actually, we've set up this special policy of a kind of partnership with countries like Ukraine and Moldova to move them closer to EU policies, but without making any promises at the moment about their future. Who knows 50 years down the road? Um, I'm Scott Fleming, and uh, my major is actually in biomedicine and technology. Uh, my question, though, is about um, values of equality, I guess. Do you think the European Union values equality in and of itself as sort of a moral aim, or do you think it's purely economic, and what are the implications of that? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think, and I mean, I haven't seen surveys on this, so I really can't tell you, but I, I think the EU citizen does consider it a moral goal, not just an economic goal. And I think, again, I think this may come out a, a little bit of the history of Europe, the European identity. Um, certainly, when the enlargement took place in 2004, 2007, that was seen not just as an economic objective, but there was, there was a feeling that these, these are our brothers and sisters. This is part of Europe. They're part of our collective history, our collective culture. We need to bring them in. We need to help them become democratic and prosperous. So I think there is very much that, that moral, I don't know if it's the right word, but that, that kind of cultural belief in Europe. Um, but on the other hand, we do see increasing concerns about immigration. That's why I brought it up, because it's a worrying trend. Now, the concerns are probably more about people who are more different, um, probably people more who are coming from outside Europe. But even inside Europe, there, there are some extremist parties who are going a bit in the other direction, but fortunately they're, they're a minority still. There's some up in the, the front here, I see, too. Up in the front? Who would you like to take next? <laughs> you, you were waving your hand very enthusiastically. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Andrew Brown. I'm studying public relations here at BYU, and um, you mentioned earlier on in your lecture that um, being a part of the European Union is voluntary. But as you talked about um, the policies and the, the legislation and immigration and fiscal policy and, and how the EU is seeking to be more cohesive and to expand, um, I kind of see that as, as being less voluntary and, and pressuring nations to remain in the EU or to join the EU. My question is, um, do you believe that the citizens of Europe sacrificed freedom to form the EU for security and for economic success? And if not, how do they, a citizen, participate in the European Union? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, certainly legally a country can leave the EU. In fact, that's even been enshrined in the, the latest treaty, the Lisbon Treaty. There's the right for a country to decide to leave. Of course, the country, the citizens of the country have to have a majority thinking that. It's not just that one newspaper decides to jump up and down and say it. But that, that is part of the public debate in the UK, and there are some people who would like to hold a referendum to leave the EU. Could happen. I, wouldn't like to see it happen, but could happen. Um, no, I don't think the con that people have lost any kind of freedom. Um, certainly, there is another level of decision-making, 
But it is a decision making that is representative, it is democratic. If you read the British press, you might think that the European Commission makes decisions and imposes it on the people, but that is not true. Um, decision making is made jointly by the Council that's made up of the countries and the European Parliament. The European Parliament is the representatives of the citizens who are elected in a, in a popular election. Um, so the citizens have representatives there. The EU process is also devoted to taking the opinions of the stakeholders and putting things out for public consultation. And the decision-making process in the EU is very lengthy, but it does allow a lot of possibilities for input, first at the policy proposal phase, which is what the Commission does. We do stakeholder consultations. But then in the process of going through the Council and the Parliament, there are lots of opportunities for people to give input. Of course, in the EU, like in the US, there are lobby groups. And you might say that some of the lobby groups have disproportionate power. But I'm not sure that that's just a characteristic of the EU. Mm -hmm. My name is Grady Baker, I'm an economic major. Um, and I just had a quick question, is that you talked about the decision-making process of economic policy and the kind of the tradition of unanimity. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if in light of this recent crisis, is that tradition going to hold or are we gonna see a change in um, that kind of tradition of unanimity? And mm -hmm. is that going to shift so that decisions can be made quicker to avert future yeah. crises? Yeah. Um, well. Certainly, this new fiscal compact will have to be signed by each individual country that joins it. And so, in that sense, it's going to be unanimity among the countries that join, because that's going to be fundamental changes. Um, we've seen in the Lisbon Treaty a lot of areas that previously were decided by unanimity that have become what's called qualified majority. Okay, So we see a trend towards reducing a legal requirement for unanimity. And I want to stress that because even though areas now have moved to qualified majority, there is still a culture of trying to get everyone on board. Okay, So in the council, and I don't have the statistics, but it's a minuscule proportion of the decisions that are actually taken by a vote. There's an attempt to find a compromise that everybody can get on, on board with. And I think maybe this, this comes back a little to the previous question. There's a feeling that the EU shouldn't be reducing the possibility for the people in the different countries to have their perspective taken into account and be part of the decision making. Um, now, we may see the trend moving that way in economics also. We may find that de jure, there'll be more possibility for qualified majority voting. But I expect this going to continue this tradition of really trying to find a compromise that, that everybody can live with. One last question. Hi, I'm Malia Folk. I'm a double major in Russian and international relations. Um, I just had a question. It just seems like the UK seems to be really reluctant when it comes especially to the economic part of the EU. So like what would be the reasons for the for UK to even stay? Like it just seems like they're not really invested in the concept. Um, the, the reasons to stay are, are, are very fundamental, that the EU, uh, the, the UK, even if it has more trade than other countries with, with third countries, still the vast majority of their trade is with other countries in the EU. Um, so it benefits from being part of this larger market. Similarly, it benefits from having its voice combined with other EU countries for international political affairs. I mean, the the UK has traditionally been an important country, but on the global scale, it has much, much, much less power than the EU does. Um, and by engaging and influencing EU opinion, which is actually what the UK normally does, the UK normally does come in pretty well prepared to council meetings and has a pretty strong voice, it has more power than being outside of the EU. Um, the reasons, as I mentioned a bit before, that there is reluctance is partly because of the city in London. Um, there's a fear that too many restraints on 
um, fiscal and economic policy could put the city's position at danger, that some of the business that the city does now might be lost to other countries. So that's a very strong lobby. I think there is still just a cultural feeling in the UK that, well, we don't have a real empire anymore, but somehow we're special. And I really think that that's driving an awful lot of it. And I say that as a, as a British citizen, but I don't agree with that opinion. But, but you see that, and you see that reflected in the press in the UK. The British press is incredible. <laughs> I mean, it comes out saying things that, many of which are not even factually correct, but then putting a slant on them that is just, just outrageous. It sells newspapers, you know, that's, that's good economics, you sell newspapers. 